Welcome to the FBC live stream. My name is Maitesia and I'm a member of the prayer ministry. We are so glad that you have joined us on today for prayer. So I'm going to be speaking to you from Romans, the first chapter, verse 16 and 17, and it reads, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believeth, to the Jew and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so I am here to remind you that it is your faith that will move mountains. It is your faith that God is asking you in this time and in this season to use and activate and to cultivate and to trust in Him alone, not in man, not in media, not in people, not in family, not in circumstances, not in your job, not even in your own way of thinking, but to trust in Him. He's calling us to believe He's calling us to only believe. And so let's pray about our faith and about our circumstances in order that we can move and do what is pleasing in His sight. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you. We love you. We appreciate you. You are a sovereign God. You are holy. You are wonderful. You are a promise keeper. You are a God that looks down, that actually comes and sit with us even in the midst of our circumstances. You walk with us, you carry us. We love on you because you are eternal. You are our Father, you are our hope, you are our joy. You are the King of kings and the, the Lord of lords. You are the great I am. You are mighty in battle and you have never lost a battle. Father, we come to you humbly. We ask you now, God, to forgive us in those areas where we have not activated and walked by faith. We have looked to circumstances. We have tried to figure things out on our own thoughts, but you said, oh God, that your thoughts are not our thoughts, that there is no possible way that we can please you without faith. We're asking you now to increase our faith, to deposit and to recalibrate, to reactivate our faith in this hour, in this season. Now is the time that we walk, we move, we act, we think by faith and that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We trust you now, God. I ask you in the name of Jesus that every single person that is listening to this broadcast, that their faith will be increased now in the name of Jesus. And it is so in the name, power, and the authority of Christ. It is so, amen. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for putting your heart and center it in this time and focusing on Jesus alone. And so that's what I'm inviting you to do in this time, in this hour, is to put your eyes back on Christ, the authority, in order that you can walk in dominion and move mountains by your faith. And so we invite you to submit your prayer request, and you can do that at any time at fbcmurfreesboro.org or at the prayer button on our mobile app. Good morning, First Baptist. You join us this morning for a morning hymn, Passion Out of Gentle Savior. And I want to encourage you also to bring every thought cap to the business Christ. We serve an awesome God and word to be praised. Just bring your, your doubts, your fears, your insecurities. Help us serve a God who will not pass you by. Amen? Here we go. We'll sing verse, second, third verse. Pass to me, not open, so stay.
Greetings, First Baptist family and friends. Thank you for joining us again for another edition of The Details. Um, before we get started, before I introduce, you know, I've, I've maybe said this before, I want to keep pushing it. The church, we have a YouTube channel. It's, write this down. You had your pen and paper because you're taking notes for the words, for the words that's coming up. It's FBC Murfreesboro Video. Uh, I want you to take a look, go search that YouTube channel, subscribe to it, turn the notifications on for two reasons. One, all this great audio and visual that we're recording, that's the best quality you'll find it on. You probably can watch it on your TV in HD, 1080p. And also two, it's exclusive content. It's gonna drop on YouTube first. So we want you to catch it. So subscribe to the channel. Let's push the subscriber view, uh, subscriber count up, okay. Today joining me for details is sister uh, Taffney Williams. I wanna thank you for joining me. Thank uh, you. And thank you for your time today. Thank you for having me. Yes. So. Again, I go to this question. Yeah. People at home probably can recite it with me at this point. Uh, I go to this question because I want to pull from you. Uh, there's somebody out there that may want to hear it as well. But during this time of isolation, you know, during this time when we've been safer at home, um, what are some things that's helped you that you've been doing? Maybe you haven't been doing it. You want to start as we, you know, maybe just talking about it. But some things that's helped you ground yourself in the Lord, help you get closer as we've been out of this uh, church building. Well, thanks. That's a great question. Mm -hmm. First of all, I, I started thinking of it less of isolation and more of incubation. Okay. A space where God has given me an opportunity to kind of say la, to pause mm -hmm. and to look at what I am doing, what I have been doing and where he wants me to move from this point forward. Mm -hmm. It is a space where I'm able to spend more time in the word mm -hmm. and spend more time in prayer. Just really starting to look at who needs prayer? How can I be effective in that prayer space? And even being active in the social media space and asking that question, hey, how can I pray for you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, those are some things that I didn't have as much time to do, mm -hmm. honestly, mm -hmm. when I was more busy, you know, doing more outside of the home. So it's really given me that time to spend time in prayer, seek the face of the Lord for what um, the next season looks like mm -hmm. and to be intentional about looking at the things that I had prioritized previously that aren't as important to me now. Okay. Uh, another thing is doing word studies. Mm -hmm. You know, as I am reading in the word, spending a lot of times in Proverbs, actually, as I'm reading the words, actually taking it out and looking at, you know, where did it come from? What was going on at the time? Digging in the word in opposed to just reading, but really spending time studying yeah. and meditating on the word daily. So it, it sounds like you're working on and you're, you're producing through a pandemic, uh, so to speak, as well, and I, and I definitely like that. So with the sermon series that's coming up, um, you know, let's talk about we will serve the Lord. Mm -hmm. Like, when you hear that phrase, uh, what does that stir up? What does that invoke in you? Um, or, you know, what are your thoughts? Like, we will serve the Lord. What does that mean to you? When I think about serving the Lord, I think about really spending time looking at um, what the disciples did, actually. Mm -hmm just studying the paths of the disciples in, in totality. So when they met Jesus, yeah. once they started following him, mm -hmm. then what they actually did, their okay. transformation process, all of that, and then taking that and building a framework of some sort for myself to say, this is the pattern that I want to follow. You know, Paul even asked, you know, follow me as mm -hmm. I follow Christ. Right. So looking at that journey that he was on and then taking the time to step back and say, hey, how can I adjust what I have, what I'm doing now mm -hmm. to be able to be that servant in this world to make sure that as we do impact, that we're impacting on the right space and, and talking about our motives behind what we do. You know, really looking at being mindful of the motives of our movements. Yes. Yeah. That alone, that's what serving the Lord looks like to me. Right, right, right. good deal, good deal. So, you know, as we, um, we're going to get out of the people's way, we want to let them move forward. But I know that, uh, Minister, you know, a lot of the congregation, they, they miss you. You, I know you miss the congregation. You would always, one of the things I always seen in your spirit is, is your willingness to pray, as you had mentioned in social media. Uh, you know, let me, let me find a different way to do it since I can't do it at the altar, right? Yeah. But um, 
Is there anything maybe that you want to uh, speak to the congregation, give them motivational words, some words to uh, to move on, to hold on to, I guess, uh, or anything you want to say directly to the church at this point? Sure. I would love to say to you guys that Jesus is there for you. He is interceding on behalf of us, even in this time of pandemic. This did not come to God by surprise. It caught us off guard. It didn't catch him off guard. So I have been leaning so much on Romans 8, 28 that tells us that all things, all things good and what we may consider bad work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. So that would be my motivation. Spend time with God. Let him refresh you. Let him show you the places of all the things that he had already had planned for you even before you were placed in your mother's womb. Mm. Spend time with him, not talking, but listening mm. and allow him to speak into your life and show you what the next season looks like. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time today. Um, First Baptist family, First Baptist friends, we're going to let you move forward in worship. You get to continue to be blessed and be a blessing. Thank you. Good. Psalm 24 says, Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. He is our King of glory. Jesus.
Listen, we're so glad to have you joining us again for this wonderful worship experience. I know the music has been blessing you. and You probably didn't want it to end, but I'm so excited now at this moment to, to bring the word of God to you. I know your worship, your life, and your discipleship is about to get upgraded by what the Lord is about to share with you. So if you have your Bible with you, if you would turn to Isaiah chapter 6 in your Bible. While you're getting there, I want to just let you know we're in the middle of a series entitled, We Will Serve the Lord. This is a series talking about the paradise for worship, how to, to have the attitude of worship and the heart of worship and the model for worship that honors God and, and serves God in this present age. And so my brother, my sister, if you're there, let's go ahead and read the word. Here's what the word of the Lord says in Isaiah chapter 6. In the New King James Version, it says this, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. And I also heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. As we continue this series entitled, We Will Serve the Lord, I want to talk today from this thought resetting the worship blueprint, resetting the worship blueprint. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. I give you glory for this opportunity to share your precious word. Now, Lord, empower me with your Holy Spirit to teach your word that the church may not miss what the Spirit of the Lord has to say to the church today, but make it plain, make it relevant, make it applicable that upon receiving the seed of the word of God in an honest and good heart and holding on to it with patience, we'd see it bring forth fruit some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. In the name of Jesus Christ, we believe that you're gonna impact our worship today in his name, we ask it all, believing it done. Amen. My brothers and sisters, I do a lot of counseling, and one of the questions I often like to ask in spaces or moments of conflict between spouses is this question, what if you're wrong? It's a question based upon the understanding that sometimes we operate in a false sense of reality or something that we perceive as truth, but in actuality is a relatively inadequate and inaccurate depiction of the truth itself. Just like many of those couples that come into counseling thinking they have it all right when in actuality they have it all wrong, in many cases, many of us have grown up in worship environments and, and we have this understanding of worship in which we were raised. The culture of our worship in our past has been such that our worship is all about certain elements that matter to us but may not really matter to God. In many cases, you may see people that when they talk about worship, they, they, they mention the colors that they may wear or they talk about annual days or they talk about which Sundays a certain person will serve or they talk about what type of communion they serve when in actuality those things though they seemingly matter to us really don't matter that much to the Lord himself the fact is we need to really ask the question when we think about our worship experiences what if I'm wrong 
What if, it, what if it's true that, that all that I've been putting my energy into it may be a part of worship, but isn't worship itself? Isn't the, the, the element of servanthood when it comes to the kingdom of God that really matters to God? It, it, it's, it's, it's a call to check our paradigm, if you will, to, to consider whether or not we have adopted the right model of worship. And so today I want to just talk about that because there may be some people on this broadcast, some people that are watching this video that are saying, wait a minute, I've been doing this, but, but there's been something missing in it. It may be an indication that God is calling you to reset the blueprint of your worship or God is calling you to reconsider how you serve him, how, how you live for him, how you, in essence, give him your life to be able to be a conduit for his plan and purpose in this world. My brothers and sisters, I want to talk about this today, and there's no greater narrative to, to invoke or to, to call upon than the narrative, the call narrative of the prophet Isaiah. We, we see this in Isaiah chapter 6, and the narrative is very simple. It goes like this, that Isaiah says, in the same year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord high and lifted up on a throne, and the Lord's train filled the temple. The Bible says that Isaiah tells us that he saw the seraphim. These seraphim stood all around the, the, the throne of God and they had six wings. With two wings, they covered their face. With two wings, they covered their feet. And with two wings, they would fly. And they would cry out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The Bible says that the, 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 the throne room and the, 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 the space would shake at the sounds of their voices. Then Isaiah immediately recognizes that he apparently is out of, out of pocket. He says, look, woe is me, for I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live amongst the people of unclean lips. The Bible says one of the angels goes to the altar and takes a burning coal from the altar and touches his lips. Then Isaiah says that he hears this voice come from the throne, and it says, who shall I send and who will go for us? Isaiah responds immediately, here am I, Lord send me. I want to walk back through this narrative because there are some pieces in this narrative that as we walk through it will sound very familiar to you. They'll sound a lot like parts of your journey or maybe parts of your life and will speak to you and show you how to take your version of worship and reset it so that your version and your blueprint of worship matches the blueprint of heaven's worship. So let's get it started here. The Bible says the first thing that happens is Isaiah experiences the death of King Uzziah. He says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. So here's principle number one. Your heavenly worship will be birthed in the same season that your carnal worship dies. Watch what happens to Isaiah. Isaiah has this king, King Uzziah, which is his uncle, very dear to his heart. But, but what happens is his uncle dies, and ironically or, or, or incidentally, in the same time or the same year that his uncle dies, he gets a vision from the Lord, but not just any vision. He gets a vision of worship from the Lord. So sometimes what happens in our lives is that, that, that we're in a space where we're in the right kingdom, but we have the wrong king. Watch this. He spends so much time being a follower of God, but has modeled his life after the carnal monarch of Israel. He, he spends his life focusing on the human king while saying he's following the heavenly king. And you know how it is that sometimes we can give a carnal reality more attention than we give our heavenly father. Can you imagine what it feels like to be God? That every morning you give breath to a person, you give strength to a person, you give life to a person, you give resources to a person, and then they look at someone else to model their lives, look at someone else to gauge their worship. I want you to understand that what Isaiah says is I could not see the Lord or I did not receive a revelation of heaven's model of worship until that which I was following died. So the question I have for you is what may be dying around you that God may be trying to remove so that you can finally see how he wants you to understand worship. I need you to understand that in many cases we see things happen in our lives and we often misclassify them and misqualify them. We say well that happened because it's something on my 
job or, or maybe God wanted me to get another opportunity or maybe this happened because I haven't been operating the right way with my finances or maybe this happened because I didn't treat my spouse well and sometimes God has to remove certain things in our lives because he wants us to see him. It's not about losing a king. It's about gaining a glimpse of what it means to follow heaven's model for worship. Understand that when he sees this, he sees a model of worship that he had not experienced and had not lived in before. Could it be that God is trying to finally remove the blinders from you, trying to finally remove the diversion from you so that he can show you what worship is really supposed to look like? My brother and my sister, I need you to understand that in the first part of this, he shows us that you cannot see heaven's blueprint for worship until you release your carnal blueprint for worship. So what might God be trying to displace from you so that he can finally replace your model of worship of him? Watch this. He said, I saw the Lord, but watch this. I saw him high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. He saw God in two ways. Number one, he saw how elevated God was. He realized that God was not a contemporary. God was not a running buddy. God was not a figment of his imagination. His God was above and beyond all that he could ask or imagine. God was above and beyond anything that was around him. He said he was high. That means that he was not common. He was not commonplace. He was high. That means that he was elevated. His holiness was elevated. His power was elevated. His presence was elevated. He was high. Not only that, but he was high and lifted up. That means he was high and beyond high. That means he was up but beyond up. That means he was elevated but beyond elevated. I need you to understand that whenever you encounter God, he won't just be high. He'll be beyond what you imagine high could look like. He's elevated. He said, but the train of his robe the train of his robe filled the temple with glory. Now in this day and time, any king that had a train, every time they would conquer a people, they would cut the garments off of their king and sew it into the train of the king that won. He said that when I saw the king's robe, when I saw the robe of God and the train of God, he said there were so many victories that they ran out of space before they could hold every victory. He said, when I saw God, it was an indication that he's a God that doesn't lose, that I was watching a God that walks in victory, that walks in authority, that walks in supremacy. So whenever you see God, the way he will introduce himself is not in a common fashion. When you see him, you'll know you've seen him because he's always high and he's lifted up and he has nothing but the opportunity and power to bring victory. He's an unfailing, unflinching, unrelenting God. He said, I saw him high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple. That's what he saw in heaven. And then he said, then I saw seraphim. Now seraphim are a classification of angels. He says that they had six wings with two wings. They covered their faces with two wings. They covered their feet and with two wings they would fly. And one would cry to the other, holy, 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 holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. Here's the second principle. God wants you to see the angelic blueprint for worship. God revealed something to him that made a difference in his blueprint. He, he wanted to show him how the angels worship. He wanted him to see what pure, unadulterated, unfiltered worship looked like. So most times we pick up our worship cues from people that look like us. Understand this, Isaiah was surrounded by people that carried the title children of Israel, but had a worship model that was dysfunctional. And sometimes we can be around people that, that have the right title, but walk with a dysfunctional model. So God gives him a glimpse of angelic worship. He shows him what worship is supposed to look like. He, he sees these seraphim and they begin to cry out holy to one another. Holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The entire earth is full of his glory. Watch this. They show us that when it comes to worship in the presence of God, their worship is consistent. It's committed and it, it, it is open. It is unadulterated. It's unfiltered. Watch this. They spend their time talking about God. That they didn't talk about the, 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 the clothes of the angels. They didn't brag on one another's wings. They, they spent their time talking about God. We, we often 
miss this glimpse of worship. I want to ask you a question. Who do you use as a model for your worship? Are, are you modeling your worship after people? Or are you spending time looking at heaven's blueprint for worship? The angels show us that when we get ready to be committed to worship, that the only thing that should happen in the presence of one another is that we spend our energy, we spend our time, and we spend our effort bragging on the power, the presence, and the supremacy of our God. You see, sometimes we can be so connected to the wrong blueprint that we adopt it as our own. And because everyone around us is doing it, we don't even realize that, that we're out of sync with heaven. And God has to take these moments, these, these moments of isolation, these moments where the veil or the curtain of heaven gets peeled back to reset us so that we can see what worship is really supposed to look like. When you consider how the angels worship and then you look at your own worship, what needs to be adjusted? What needs to be changed? God wanted us to see what it looked like when the angels worshiped. He wanted us to get a glimpse of, of how to properly talk about him how to properly brag on him. The Bible says that, that the entire room got filled with smoke. The, 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 the walls and the space began to shake. When was the last time your house shook with worship? It should be something that allows everything around you to feel the intensity of the worship coming from you. The Bible says that they began to worship him. And as he watched them, like a kid on the sideline, worshiping them, he began to realize I'm in a place that I really shouldn't be because there's no way you can encounter the holiness of God and rest comfortably in the dysfunction of your humanity. He said, woe is me for I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips and I come from a people of unclean lips and I've beheld the King of glory. Watch this, after seeing the model of worship the angels rendered, he began to look within. That leads to our third point. Are you being honest about your current blueprint of worship? Watch this, he, he, he says in essence, I'm off base. The way I've been doing this is out of order. He says not only is it out of order, but specifically, I have unclean lips. The words I've been speaking have been out of order. My language has been off base. I, I've been using, con having conversations that, that dishonor God more than honor him. And he said on top of that, I hang around folk that don't honor God in the way they live. He said, I live amongst people that have unclean lips. In other words, I'm the product of a context that has caused more spiritual dysfunction in me than it has enhanced the spiritual function of me. And I'd ask you the question, who are you hanging around? Are, are the people around you producing a worship in you? Or are they producing a higher level of dysfunction in you? He, he says, my language changed because I'm around people that talk the wrong way. Watch this, my language of God and about God changed because I talk to people that have dysfunctional language. Could it be that the way you talk about your circumstances is off base because you're around people that talk like they don't have faith? Or people that have conversations that lack joy? Or people that have conversations that lack positivity and optimism? Could it be that, that because people don't talk about Jesus, you find yourself not talking about Jesus? The Bible says that Isaiah began to come to these revelations and, and these realizations that, that, man, I'm out of order. And I want to ask you this. When you look at your worship model in its truest form and you compare it with the worship model of heaven, would you come to that same conclusion? Lord, I'm out of order. But watch this. There's a grace in it in that he was out of order but God still invited him. Oh gosh, oh gosh. He had an issue, but God still welcomed him. He, he had problems and he had shortcomings, but God still gave him access to him. I need you to understand that, that many times we don't get access to the presence of God because we've got it right. We get access to the presence of God because his mercy looks beyond our stuff so that he can still have fellowship with us. 
My brothers and sisters, the beauty of the moment is that God has invited you back into his presence. God has invited you into a space where he can now have a conversation with you about the worship he's trying to pull out of you. He can now sit you down and talk to you one-on-one -on -one about who he's calling you to be and what he's calling you to do. Let me ask you this. Have you realized that you're in the presence of God at the hand and at the bequest of his grace? Have you realized you're in the presence of God because of his mercy? Why would a merciful God give access to a messed up human? It's because he has a plan for you. He has an outline strategy for you. And one of those strategies is to reset your blueprint for worship. The Bible says that as soon as he gets finished making the statement, as soon as Isaiah gets finished talking about how messed up he is, an angel comes and pulls a live coal off of the altar and places it on the place where Isaiah said he had the issue. Hmm. Can I say it again? He, he takes the coal and he puts it on the very place of Isaiah's issue, which leads to our next point. Isaiah had to be prepared by God for worship. Watch this. Isaiah didn't fight it. Isaiah didn't run from it. Isaiah let him touch the lips with the coal. He let him get access to him. He sat there while, while the angel ministered to the place that was the most out of order. So have you allowed the Lord to minister to the area that's out of order so that he can reset your worship? Have you allowed the Lord access to the place where he desires to do the greatest reconstructive work so that he can get your life in order? Have you allowed the Lord to have access to the place that he's trying to fix so that your worship can come into alignment. The Bible says, when the angel touches his lips, he says this, now that this has touched your lips, your iniquity has been removed. Oh gosh. And your sin, hallelujah, has been purged, hallelujah. He says, heaven knew you messed up, but we had a plan for it. Heaven knew you had some issues, but we had a plan for it. Watch what happens. He says, I'm going to touch the area, but not only will I touch it, I'm going to clean it. He says, because of this encounter, the way you came will be different from the way you leave. He says, I'm going to remove the iniquity. Now, the iniquity is the soul sin. It's the impulse that causes the transgression. He says, I'm going to take the appetite for it away from you. Hallelujah. I don't know who I'm teaching today, but I know you're on here. He says, the reason you've had it is because people gave you the wrong appetite, but there's not an appetite people can give you that I can't pull from you. He says, I'm going to, to remove the appetite for it. Tell your neighbor the appetite's about to leave. The appetite is about to leave. He says after that, he says now after I remove the iniquity, he says now your sin has been purged. Wait a minute. This means the record of it, the presence of it, and the power of it has been purged. Now sin means to miss the mark. He says now everything that's kept you from the mark of God has been removed. Wait a minute. That means that all of the things that kept me from being in alignment with God, God has the ability to remove them so that now what may me out of order has been displaced so that I can be in order. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you're from or what you're going through, but I came to tell you that God's about to put you back in order. God's about to reconfigure you and reset you so that your worship is back in order, so that your praise is back in order, so that your fellowship with him is back in order. Somebody ought to open up your mouth, lift up your hands and say, Lord, I thank you for putting me back in order. Lord, I thank you that my mouth is about to change. My heart is about to change. My worship is about to change. My praise is about to change. My fellowship, my discipleship is all about to get upgraded. He's putting me back in order. After the Lord resets him, then the Lord makes a request. He says, who shall I send and who will go for us? Watch this. The Lord says, I'm looking for people that aren't caught up in the being of worship, but their desire is for the going of worship. They don't want to just walk around with a title or to be in a certain state. They want to be ambassadors, if you will. They want to be those that go on behalf of the worship of the kingdom of God. 
He says, who will go for us? Isaiah says, here am I. Send me. Wait a minute. Isaiah says, there's no way in the world you can clean me this much and I not use it to spread the power of worship. I, there's no way I cannot use it to show the world what heaven's worship is supposed to look like. Remember, he came from a people of unclean lips and his only desire was to go back and to show them that the worship you've been carrying on isn't the worship God calls you to do. The worship you've been exhibiting isn't the worship that, that the Lord calls you to operate in. I want you to see. He said, let me go. Let, let me go and show a world what worship really looks like. Let me show the world heaven's blueprint for worship. Watch this. The Bible says, he says, here am I. Send me. Here's the question I have for you. Are you willing to make yourself available to show a world what worship really really looks like? Are you willing to not just be transformed by Christ, not just have your heart changed by Christ, but to say, I want to be an ambassador that everywhere my feet trod, I want people to see what worship really looks like. I want people to see what praise really looks like. Or do you want to just be undercover? Jesus said, you're the light of the world. No one lights a candle to put it under a bushel. I came to tell you, if God has prepared you for worship, it wasn't for you to worship in silence. It was for you to show the world what it looks like to follow God what it looks like to live for God, what it looks like to extol God, what it looks like to honor God in every space, every day, every time, and with every person. Is there a person on this broadcast that'll shout, here am I, send me, send me. I know I had some issues in my past, but Lord, you did so much on the cross for me. I can't help but to show a world what redemptive worship looks like, what saved worship looks like, what transformed life looks like. I came to tell you that what Isaiah says to heaven is he says, look, I'm not going to let you put in this much work just to stay at home with it. But if you're going to do the work on me, if you're going to transform me, let me at least go and show the world around me what worship looks like. And the Bible reminds us in this statement of our last point, which is this, that God positions us so that we can understand what his model of worship looks like for the sole purpose of being able to show others what it really looks like to follow the Lord. Watch this, Isaiah does something that's almost prophetic. He says, I've been in your presence. I've been rectified before heaven. And the only thing I ask that you let me do is go back to where I came from Go back to the place and show people what worship looks like. Wait a minute. Doesn't that sound familiar? Isn't that what Jesus did according to Paul in Philippians chapter 2? He says he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made of himself no reputation and came in the form of a servant and became obedient to God, even to the point of that. Wait a minute. Servanthood, obedience, that, that means worship. That means he, he came to show us what worship looked like. He came to show us heaven's model for worship. He wanted to give us a paradigm so that Paul could say in Romans 8, 29 that we're being conformed to the image of Christ. In other words, Jesus showed us worship so that then we could look like Jesus in our worship and then show this world what worship really looks like. So could it be that God has allowed you to go through a difficult season to bring a worship out of you that will reflect his glory and that will impact the world around you? Is there anyone here that'll shout, I'm ready to let the world see what worship looks like. I'm ready to show a world what the heart of God looks like. I'm ready to show a world what it means to follow him with unadulterated and unashamed fellowship with him. I I'm ready to show a world what worship looks like in the school and in the workplace and in the marriage and, and raising kids. I'm ready to show a world what worship looks like. All Isaiah is saying is this. He's saying, my worship changed in the year that I lost what I used to worship. My worship went to another level in the same season where the thing I thought I couldn't live without ended up being taken from me. Maybe God is not trying to take something from you. Maybe he's trying to exchange the king you've always had with the king he's called you to follow. It's time for you to reset your worship blueprint. If you would pray this prayer with me, simple prayer. Once you've changed me, Lord, send me so that I can show others how to worship you. 
in Jesus' name. I ask this. Amen. Listen, my brothers and sisters, you may be on this broadcast and you've never given your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And today, you want to give your life to Christ. You, you've been hearing this broadcast and you realize, Lord, you've given me this breath and I want to use the life I've been given to worship you. Well, it's pretty simple. It begins with you accepting the fact and confessing the fact that you're a sinner, that you're out of alignment with the will of God and the plan of God. You were born in sin, shaped in iniquity, if you will, and, and that means that you're out of fellowship with God. But you believe in your heart that God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross to pay for the full price of your sin debt. And through the death on the cross, your sins have been fully paid. Not only did he die, but God raised him up on the third day and has given him all authority over heaven and earth and also given him the power to give eternal life to those that follow him. And then finally, you confess Jesus as the Lord of your life where you receive him as the ruler of your life. And in that moment, where you acknowledge that, you believe that, and you confess that the Bible says you will be saved. So when the wrath of God comes upon this world, that we will be saved through the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we will spend eternity with God. Now, if you make that confession, if that's the, the belief you've received in your heart today, and you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you to go on the app or go on the website to where it says Join FDC. Click that link, fill out the information, and then submit it. Also, if you're on here and you need a church home, you want to make our church home your church home, or you're in the area but you're without a church home locally, and you want to come under what we call Watch Care, I encourage you to go to that same link, fill out the information, and submit it. Once you submit it, our team will get back with you. And let me just say on behalf of the First Baptist Church family, welcome to First Baptist Church. We're so glad to have you as a part of our church family. Hello, family. Thanks for joining us for today's worship. Check out these updates. Discipleship is in our DNA, and we have so many resources and tools on the FBC app in the Growth Zone to help you grow in the faith. You can also register for the Midday Bible Study on the FBC app or the website. Join us every Wednesday at noon for deep topics designed to take your life to the next level. Join us this Wednesday. FBC family and friends, we want to thank you for your support during this time. We are still able to make so much of an impact in our community because of your giving. If you desire to give, here are three ways you can give today. First, you can go through the FBC app or the website. You can also give through the Givelify app. And finally, you can mail your gift to FBC. Our address is 738 East Castle Street, Murfreesboro, Tennessee, 37130. Thanks again for making Kingdom Impact with your gifts. We believe in the power of prayer, and we are still praying together. Put a reminder in your calendar for Sundays at 7.40 a.m. Just simply call the prayer line at 425-436-6376 and enter the access code 489-244. If you have a prayer request, let us pray with you. Prayer requests can be submitted daily via the website or FBC app. You can also text them to 615 615- 624-4170. And finally, if this worship experience blessed you, watch it again and again. Be transformed by the word and share it with others who need to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Be blessed and join us for next Sunday's broadcast. So my brothers and sisters, let me close out today with prayer. Father, we thank you for this time together. We pray now in the name of Jesus Christ that as we go through this week, that you would begin to reveal a model of worship to our hearts that will reset our worship blueprint so that we may worship you in spirit and in truth in a way that will give you glory. In the name of Jesus, we ask it all, believing it done, my brothers and sisters, may the love of God, the peace of God, and the grace of God rest, rule, and abide with each of you until we meet again on this side or in glory. And all that received it, received it by saying, amen. God bless you. We'll see you next week.